All right, well, welcome everyone to Hemp Insulation 101. Before we get started, I do want to give a shout out to one of our top tier sponsors, Sun Radon, uh, monitoring the air quality to make sure you and your clients are healthy. Uh, the first thing that they do that's really exciting is they look at uh, five components, radon, uh, CO2 equivalents, VOC, temperature, pressure, and humidity, all in real time, all reporting data, so you and your clients can make informed decisions on your projects. One interesting thing is they have the mold risk indicator that will tell you if there's a concern that you might be uh, harboring potential uh, uh, mold opportunities by the way your building is performing, and you can take immediate action. Uh, they have it set up in color, so I have one of these. It's always cool to kind of see the color change. Well, it's not cool when the color isn't green, but it changes to uh, yellow changes to red, tells you if something's going on. Hey, you should probably look at your app or your computer, get a sense of what's going on and decide if you need to increase your ventilation or take some sort of other action. Um, you know, they have, uh, 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 again, daily, weekly, and monthly uh, indoor air quality summary reports that you can check out, uh, get updates to your phone or tablet. Uh, it can synchronize with HVAC systems as well for smarter HVAC systems. Uh, and it's got secure uh, data storage backup as well, again, that you can help make informed decisions with. For those of you who are builders and you've got multiple projects or developers with multiple properties, what's cool about this is you can put these devices in all of those properties or all of your new homes that you build and prove that they are green, uh, right? And show that there's good air quality and make informed decisions and get a sense of what's going on either in all the projects you're building or all the developments you're managing. If you're a home inspector, you take these, or a green home inspector, you take these in the field and you can get that radon data, which you need for your Green Star certification or other health reports that you might be doing uh, in the field. So check out Sun Radon. If you're a Green Home Institute member, uh, we've got a code for you. They're giving you 15% off all their products. Thanks to our second tier sponsor, Rockwell, they're making super sustainable insulation that can go under the slab, which is really cool, and all the way to the top to the bottom of the house, spun uh, rock, no foam, foam free, uh, so potentially lower embodied carbon, less toxic outputs, and so they have that type of insulation. Again, you can put it right under the slab, all the way up top to bottom, uh, and get that good uh, insulation value. They're doing trainings and they're having a sweepstake that's ongoing. So make sure to check out their R Class Builder Program. Always exciting stuff that's going on there. Uh, so rock on with Rockwell. All right, so Hemp Insulation 101. Uh, this session is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little. I'm the education manager here, and we've got a whole team here ready to help you. Eliza is going to help you with your green building certification programs. And Jose Reyna, our board directors, uh, our executive director is going to help you with uh, membership and other different uh, um, uh, uh, collaborations you may want to have with us. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, as well as Passive House Institute US. AIA Health, Welfare and Safety makes it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. And three of the five green pillars in our program energy, health, and materials as well. Um, so uh, I missed a slide here, but that's okay. Uh, I'm super excited to uh, introduce and hand you off to our uh, speaker here, uh, Sean with Hempitecture. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we need to have more sustainable insulation choices uh, in what we're doing. And so that's one of the super exciting uh, reasons I'm here. I'm, I, we, you know, we wanted to have Sean and Hepatecture on our show. So I'll let Sean take it from here, introduce himself and Hepatecture, and um, welcome everyone. Uh, Sean, please take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Brett. Um, really appreciate uh, you putting this together uh, for us today. This is kind of a, a momentous occasion um, in that uh, this is our first uh, accredited CEU program with, with uh, AIA and, and all the other credits that uh, Brett had mentioned. So can't thank uh, the Green Home Institute and all their supporters and sponsors uh, for making this possible today. Um, so I'm Sean Torbert. I'm a lead AP, a certified pass consultant designer, and I also have a master's of sustain, uh, 
a master's of science in sustainability management for Columbia University. Uh, I've been in the, the green building world um, since about 2007. And I'm really excited to, to present um, what we're doing here at Hempitecture, um, you know, in order to address, uh, you know, not only operational energy and carbon, but also embodied carbon or upfront carbon, um, really to be able to um, mitigate the um, climate crisis uh, by focusing on whole life carbon. So I'm going to dive right in. And uh, my colleague, Max, uh, who's our technical inside tech, technical salesperson, is out in Idaho, uh, manning the uh, questions and chat. So please feel free to ask any questions to him. Um, I'm based uh, in New Jersey uh, at, at the northern part of the Jersey Shore, kind of in the shadow of New York City. Um, so welcome everyone, very excited and, and appreciate uh, the positive response uh, so far. So real quick, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about hemp protection. Um, we are a manufacturer um, of hemp fiber insulation. We are registered in the state of Delaware as a public benefit, benefit corporation, which is a corporation created to generate social and public good and to operate in a responsible and sustainable manner. And I'm gonna give you a little video here of one of our projects in LA. Okay, so um, how we started off uh, about eight years ago was really as a, a senior thesis project um, from our CEO and founder, Maddie Mead, who wanted to bring hempcrete uh, construction and uh, natural building techniques to the United States. Um, so we were one of the first to actually start building hempcrete projects in the United States, as well as uh, develop the supply chains for the raw materials um, and also uh, doing training workshops to educate people on how to build that way. Um, it became evident after a few years that um, it was going to take a long time to really scale that into the mainstream marketplace. So about three years ago, the focus was shift into uh, developing a hemp wool uh, insulation or a hemp fiber insulation for the U.S. market. Um, for the last several years, we've been importing uh, that product to do a test market. And now as of uh, February 17th, we'll have the grand opening of our first US factory in Idaho, which is sourcing the uh, industrial hemp fiber from Montana. So the important things to realize about hemp fiber is it's a one-to-one -one replacement for traditional bad insulations, fibrous insulations, you know, whether that's fiberglass or mineral wool types of products. Um, we are now manufacturing in Idaho, and we have uh, we are developing a Class A fire rated uh, product that uh, uses a bio based zero VOC flame retardant. We expect to have that uh, shortly in 2023. Here's a picture of our new factory again, which will be opening February 17th. So if anybody's in the Idaho area and would like to uh, uh, join us for the ribbon cutting um, festivities, please uh, shoot me an email and we're, we're happy to get you an invite. And once completed, um, we should be able to do about 20 million square feet of hemp wool from this one facility. And it is kind of a micro factory that can be um, replicated in all uh, hemp growing uh, areas throughout the United States. Um, along those same lines, we uh, towards the end of 2022, we just were awarded um, 
a, uh, through a, an incubator in New York State called Grow New York. Um, we were awarded money to research the feasibility of opening up operations in New York State uh, and partnering with uh, industrial hemp growers uh, throughout the region. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the AIA portion. Um, so no more, no more brand uh, talking. Um, so first we're gonna go through, uh, I'll actually take a look at the learning objectives. We're gonna go through the history of hemp um, we're going to talk about embodied carbon, operational carbon. We're going to talk about how it applies uh, to lead, um, how it fits into other sort of green building frameworks like Passive House or Living Building Challenge. And then we're going to look at uh, installation. So the history of hemp, um, as I'm not sure everyone knows, but uh, you know, hemp fiber is actually one of the earliest uh, natural fibers to be used by uh, humankind. Uh, going back about 50,000 years, it was known to be a very um, strong fiber for textiles, fabrics, cordage, uh, things of that nature. Um, in the architectural record, it's actually found in uh, China and Japan, um, you know, as early as, uh, you know, several hundred uh, years uh, BCE. Uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, in particular Herodotus, um, documented uh, people burning hemp seeds uh, for its pleasurable effects and sort for also um, uh, spiritual purposes. Uh, as we move forward into uh, the common era, um, there is uh, documentation of hemp in um, the Mishnah uh, from uh, Jewish uh, people living in Palestine around 200 common era. And then it sort of spread throughout med medieval Europe, uh, in Germany, Italy, um, the Spanish brought it to the new world and started cultivating it in Chile. Um, the ropes and sails and canvas used by Christopher Columbus were all hemp fiber. Um, so again, this is a, known to be a very, very great fiber for pretty much all of modern humanity. Uh, moving into the 17th century uh, has been documented that um, the settlers of uh, what would become the United States uh, learned and traded uh, hemp growing um, cultivation with the Wampanoag peoples uh, in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in Massachusetts. It's well documented that uh, uh, George Washington was a hemp grower as well as several other founding fathers. Um, so again, you know, known throughout history to be a very useful uh, product and fiber. Um, fast forward to the 1930s and, um, you know, because of the Great Depression and sort of rising um, nationalist tendencies, anti-immigrant and racist sentiment, um, there was some propaganda put out uh, by movies such as Reefer Madness um, to kind of scare people away from cannabis sativa. But then, you know, during World War II, uh, we in the U.S. kind of changed our minds and actually put out propaganda films saying that industrial hemp fiber was essential for the war efforts, um, kind of similar to what we're seeing now with the breakdown of global supply chains and geopolitical instability. Um, hemp really became essential during the World War II war effort for the U.S. Navy, as well as the other armed services to make cordage, rope, canvas uh, for uniforms, um, all sorts of, of products. So then we get to 1970 um, with uh, sort of the drug laws that were enacted under President Nixon, which then put industrial hemp as a schedule one drug alongside um, the psychoactive sister of industrial hemp, um, you know, better known as marijuana. Um, and basically, you know, industrial hemp doesn't have any psycho, psychoactive properties. Um, however, because it was virtually indistinguishable, indistinguishable from, the, um, from the psychoactive uh, version, um, it was all lumped together. All of the, the hemp crops were burned, all the seeds were destroyed, and we basically lost all of that agricultural knowledge um, until 2018 when the US passed the Farm Bill re-legalizing industrial hemp. Um, after that, we saw a boom and bust in CBD, which uh, comes from um, flower of, of uh, industrial hemp. Um, and now we're actually, you know, as we're relearning how to, to grow industrial hemp and, and optimizing 
various genetics and cultivar cultivars for different climate regions. Um, we're now shifting uh, back to uh, fiber-based uh, industrial hemp. And in 2022, uh, we manufactured um, uh, domestically grown and uh, manufactured industrial hemp insulation. So uses of hemp. Um, a lot of people say it's, it's the plant with up to 50,000 uses. Um, this is sort of a, a nice old uh, scientific drawing of the different uh, parts of uh, cannabis sativa or hemp. Um, so there's the fiber from the stalk, there's uh, seeds from the grain, um, oil, food, paper, bioplastics, uh, all sorts of things. Do we have a question, Brett? Well, it, and maybe I, I missed it, but when was it that hemp insulation started coming on the scene again? Oh, sure. So um, hemp insulation has actually uh, been used uh, globally. Uh, however, uh, because the, the cultivation of it was illegal in yeah. the United States, um, it's really only been the last few years with the imported versions um, that it, we're starting to see it used in the United States again. Okay, but they've been insulating buildings with it for hundreds of years. Um, in the modern era, I know it's been used in, um, yeah. you know, used throughout, uh, you know, Canada, Europe, uh, other places, Scandinavia. Right. Um, however, in its modern form as a bat insulation yeah. uh, product, I'm not sure. I, I would be surprised if it wasn't used even in, you know, colonial and pre-colonial times when they were doing a lot of like mud daub and straw and plastic oh, sure. types yeah. of, um, you know, it's a natural fiber. So I would think if they had access to it, it would be suitable for those types of applications, but I don't have the actual historical documentation of that. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yep. So looking at it another way, um, you know, again, it's, there's, various parts of the plants, all of them can be used for different things. So the stalk um, can be used for herds. And then there's actually the bast fibers that come off the stock, stalk. That's what's used for the fiber products. So whether it's textiles and insulation, um, the roots can be used for compost and, and medicine. Uh, the seeds are used a lot in health foods as well as um, bio-based oils. Um, and then leaves, flowers uh, can be used for CBD uh, and other things. Okay, so getting into um, the building sector. So, you know, we see different statistics here. It's sort of generally accepted that buildings in the US generate about 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I've seen different things, 30%, 40%, depending on um, what your primary energy source is. Uh, it's important to realize that, you know, up until we really started changing the energy codes, about 90% of that was um, from operational carbon, mainly heating and cooling of business, uh, of buildings. Um, so embodied carbon, which is now also being called upfront carbon um, or upfront energy, refers to the, um, the emissions from the extraction, manufacturing, um, installation and end of life uh, of building materials. And we'll see here in a few slides um, why that's becoming increasingly important um, with the limit amount of time we have to address the climate crisis. Uh, in addition, um, you know, indoor air quality uh, and outdoor air pollution um, cause a myriad of health uh, problems um, and as well as are very costly uh, to the public and taxpayers at large. So um, we deserve something better. This is a slide kind of tying it all together from the World Green Building Council. So again, operational carbon um, is basically the heating, cooling, plug loads, um, you know, things of that nature, the actual, you know, the, the carbon cost or the emissions of operating your building. Again, embodied carbon or upfront carbon is the materials themselves. That's why we're seeing places um, legislate carbon accounting as well as, you know, trying to find solutions for, um, uh, uh, for, for, less heavy industry products like steel or concrete, um, or even you know, some petrochemical based uh, or um, uh, you know, other types of products that require an enormous amount of upfront energy to manufacture and or transport or all of the above. You add the operational carbon to the embodied carbon and that gives you the whole life carbon. So that's really the whole picture, right? 
Okay, if we look at um, building construction and materials, now this is from uh, from 2013, um, and you can see building construction and materials was considered to be about six percent of the emissions, with you know all of the uh, building industries, um, uh, not including uh, um, heavy industry, um, accounting for about half of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. Now, as we've got made our buildings more efficient that 5.9% is increasing and can be even higher um, and, and more important in the short time um, because we don't get to get the payback for the energy efficiency over the life, life of the building within you know, the next seven to 10 years. How um, the various green building frameworks kind of um, complement each other. I'm not gonna say they compete because I think they all are very complementary depending on what your sustainability goals are, but things like Passive House are 100% about energy and comfort. Um, that fits into, I, I always think it's like a you know a trivial pursuit um, uh, playing piece there, uh, but fits into the, the energy uh, portion of living building challenge. And then in LEED, um, it, it really applies to uh, the energy and atmosphere, um, sort of the largest chunk of, uh, of credits that you can get for LEED. And we'll get deeper into you know, specific versions of LEED um, in future slides. So again, these are all complementary, not necessarily competitors. So with that in mind, um, sort of the basics of uh, the passive house standard, um, we should note that passive house is different than passive solar. Passive solar was developed in the 70s and 80s here in the United States. Um, however, what was missing was uh, the, balance, um, the balanced uh, heat recovery ventilation or energy recovery ventilation. It took uh, Dr. Wolfgang Feist in Austria and, and the German Passive House Institute to kind of put that in uh, to the um, recipe there for, for passive house buildings. Um, however, there is a little bit lost in the, tra the translation from the German passive house, H-A-U-S, which means passive building, um, to, uh, you know, uh, English passive house. Passive house really means passive building. Um, so uh, passive houses are neither, neither passive, nor are they just for houses. They can be any building typology, you know, from, from a single family home up to high rise, uh, you know, skyscrapers, hospitals, prisons, schools, uh, et cetera. The five basic principles though um, are air tightness. So an airtight envelope, uh, continuous insulation, thermal bridge free construction or minimizing those thermal, th thermal bridges through the building enclosure or building envelope. Um, high performance doors and windows, usually triple pane, thermally broken. Uh, and then uh, the balanced uh, energy recovery ventilation or heat recovery ventilation. And if we look just at the operational uh, energy and operational carbon, um, you can see on the right there, um, those are buildings uh, for passive that um, are passive house. Uh, and then you look at where the International Energy Conservation Code is. So it becomes evident that really, you know, we, we, we have things figured out on how to get to uh, near zero energy uh, operational uh, carbon, um, right? So we can reduce uh, as, as much energy as possible using these basic design principles with a holistic view of uh, your home or building. Um, and I always like to say, you know, the, the, the cheapest and greenest uh, form of energy is the energy you don't use. Uh, and I think this slide highlights that. Okay, so now how does uh, embodied carbon or upfront carbon uh, integrate into this? Um, this is um, from a lot of the work that Ed Masria has been pioneering with, with Architecture 2030. And um, so what you're seeing there in the turquoise is the operational carbon, right? Or the, the energy it uses to run your building. And you know, you'll hear a lot of claims about um, you know, products uh, being net zero carbon over the life of the building. You know that that may be true for buildings that are sixty to you know have a life you know span of sixty to seventy five years. However, uh, because of the climate crisis and the crisis in the Paris Accord trying to limit global warming to one point five degrees Celsius, the operation or the embodied carbon has a huge impact in the the next decade. Okay, so there's not enough time to amortize those energy savings from the heavy industry products now over the life of a building. So hopefully that makes sense. And here you can kind of see that, um, you know, it, it's a cumulative, um, um, 
these these uh, turquoise lines for operational carbon is cumulative carbon sequestration over the life of the building from energy efficiency, if that makes sense. So again, embodied carbon is essential um, right now. Oops, went the wrong way. So what's the solution? Um, the solution is, is really looking towards bio-based products or products that can sequester carbon within the building um, that address whole life carbon, both embodied and operational. Um, and even better is if we can you know, create those local economies, create jobs, shorten those supply chains, right? Because transportation, you know, until we get you know, all electric uh, transportation um, sourced from renewable energy, you know, shortening those distances is going to reduce um, the overall um, carbon footprint. Um, and then even better is if um, the, the plant or the plant-based product is, uh, is a plant that can clean the soil, rejuvenate the soil, doesn't require pesticides, um, uses less water than traditional industrial crops, et cetera. So why hemp? So hemp um, has very high yield um, per acre. There's a reason why it's called weed, right? Because it chokes out uh, a lot of the other weeds. It, it grows um, very quickly. Um, it, it uses little to no pesticides, uh, inexpensive and abundant, uh, regenerative to the soil, multiple products that can be used for it. Um, end of life, it can be composted or turned into biochar. Um, or reused, uh, and it's, it's really suitable for every agricultural climate in the United States. In addition, it, um, it sequesters about 10 tons of, of CO2 per acre of hemp grown, or, uh, or about two cars um, worth of emissions per acre. In addition, it has no VOCs, uh, no toxins, it's safe to touch, um, and because of its dimensional stability and the way it pressure fits or friction fits into your stud cavity, um, it gives you that, that uh, grade one uh, installation, um, which you know, we'll talk about later. Um, you know, one of the things with handling it is you know, other types of fibrous materials like fiberglass or mineral wool can really get, uh, get itchy to deal with, uh, not to mention you know, issues with contact dermatitis and even allergies um, from, from excessive handling of those products. Um, and uh, hemp uh, seems to be much better um, from that perspective. Okay, so looking at uh, embodied carbon, this is based on an R13 bat insulation. And this was done by uh, the um, city of Nelson in Ontario, Canada. Um, so keep in mind, uh, you know, this is based on the supply chains there. And you can see, um, you know, hemp fiber bat, um, you know, really towards the, the negative uh, uh, embodied carbon um, side of that. And you can imagine as we get thicker, um, obviously the things in the red will go more into the red and the green will go more into the green. Um, we are seeing different data though. Um, so if you look at it for an R28 uh, bat insulation, hemp fiber seems to be even lower according to this study. And we're um, really excited to get our LCAs um, for our EPDs uh, generated from our Idaho facility because we think um, we can even improve on um, this carbon footprint and embodied carbon. Um, one other thing that's nice about uh, hemp uh, bat insulation is it's a one-to-one -one replacement. So for, for you know, traditional 16 inch on center wood framing or even advanced framing uh, techniques, 24 inches on center, um, it's comparable to other bat insulations on the market. Um, so everybody knows how to use it. Uh, it's, you just stuff it in and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you're good to go. So as far as some of the technical data, um, this technical data is, is based on uh, the imported version that we have been using up till now in the US market. Um, so we are now, uh, and if you see um, you know, one concern, especially as you get into anything beyond type five or type three construction, meaning single family homes or duplexes is the requirements for class A, um, uh, 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 class A fire retardant um, properties. Uh, based on ASTM E84. 
So um, what we've done is actually uh, we've developed a prototype that um, you know we're fine tuning right now and has been tested uh, to meet that class A um, fire retardancies through ASTM E84, uh, and it um, does use a bio-based zero VOC flame retardant. So we really think this product is going to be uh, completely disruptive to the insulation market uh, at large and give us the ability to scale quickly uh, and start sequestering carbon in every building that uses it. So in addition, um, there's a lot of interest in hemp fiber. Again, you know, similarly to uh, World War II with hemp for victory, um, the USDOE is, um, has uh, been um, supplying a lot of grants for research and study of you know, not only um, the fibrous insulation, uh, but also different cultivars and genetics of hemp uh, and how they, um, how they grow in the various climate zones within the US. But this is from a few weeks ago uh, in the ham test, changer, uh, test chamber at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, which is uh, ham stands for heat, air, and moisture. And just kind of a quick video of what it looks like when you install it. Notice no gloves. Um, he's wearing long sleeves, but you know doesn't really need to because it's not going to irritate his skin. And this is comparing it to sort of a traditional unfaced uh, fiberglass bat insulation. So that testing is underway right now, and we're very excited to uh, to see the results and uh, publish those. Okay, getting into lead and hers. Um, so in general, the sort of, you know, high level overview of lead credits, um, you know, these are all the, the, the potential lead credits you can get from using uh, hemp uh, bat insulation. Um, so energy and atmosphere, obviously, as I showed you on the previous slide, that's the, the big chunk of points, um, but also in the material and resources category. Um, and then also uh, indoor environmental uh, quality, right, because it has zero VOCs um, and uh, does not emit any VOCs, all that type of stuff. Uh, and then we're also uh, looking into the acoustical performance. Um, we uh, are predicting that it's going to perform similarly to fiberglass or mineral wool uh, insulation um, from uh, an acoustical perspective, whether that's STC or OITC ratings. Uh, however, that uh, testing is um, uh, planned as well. And then uh, potential for innovation credits, right? Although you would need to use your lead AP uh, to submit that. Okay, um, getting into lead V4 uh, uh, for BD and C multifamily, um, there is uh, uh, an uh, environmentally preferable products. Uh, and in general, um, that's, uh, that's one point. And the goal of this is to, you know, use bio-based products um, and other types of products that are legally harvested um, based on ASTM test method D6866, which is how you get the USDA certified bio-based product. Um, currently, the, the product uh, that was being imported um, was anywhere from 89.9% to 92% hemp fiber. Um, the other eight to 10 percent is a uh, polyester uh, textile fiber, um, you know, probably in, in, you know, a shirt or clothing that you're wearing now, even my vest here. Um, so one point available for that. Um, and then if we get into building product disclosure and opt optimization, um, this is where e the EPD will come into place. Um, so if you have EPDs, um, depending on the type of EPD, um, you can get uh, either you know, a portion of the credit or a whole credit, or you can even get 200% um, of, uh, uh, of the credit or double the credits if uh, it's, um, if it's uh, manu uh, sorry, uh, if it's extracted or harvested, manufactured, and delivered within 100, uh, 100 miles. So that's really the, up, up, you know, the, the ultimate goal is, is how can we, um, you know, have that distributed uh, uh, manufacturing capabilities in local communities to minimize the distance traveled. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Okay, or you can do a, um, option two is a multi-attribute optimization. 
Um, so this is, you know, third, uh, this is um, based on the uh, cost and the total value of the permanently installed product um, within the project. Um, so third party certified, um, and then you also have to have uh, at least three uh, of the, the categories listed there um, to get the 100% of their cost credit for, uh, for the lead achievement calculations. Uh, and again, oh, again, this is the, the 100 miles, um, you can double uh, those credits. Um, one other note on this, um, for products uh, in the enclosure materials, that can't constitute more than 30% of the value of all the, the compliant uh, building products. Okay, so looking at annual energy use, um, this is specific for uh, LEED, BD, and C uh, for homes. And the goal of this is to, to reduce uh, the energy usage um, of the home. Okay, so, and this is where it ties together with the HERS index. So any HERS raters out there, this, this applies to you. Um, there's option one, which is the lead energy budget. So that's based on a percentage less than the lead energy budget based on lead reference homes. So a lead reference home um, looks at the number of bedrooms and then compares that to the wall exterior wall or exterior wall area or building enclosure building envelope of the home with limits on size right so you know we don't want um you know these these massive uh you know there there's basically a penalty for these massive mcmansions or i guess the architectural term is um you know american eclectic or modern eclectic uh types of, of projects um, so really sort of, you know, looking at the, the massing of, of the homes as well. Um, the option two uh, is with using a HERS rater um, and uh, using the HERS index uh, with the home size adjuster. Uh, and really you need to achieve an index of 70 or better. We'll take a look at those um, charts now, those tables now. So looking at the uh, percent reduction um, for option one, um, this is a percentage uh, below uh, the the um, the lead home, uh, and as you see the ult the ultimate is ninety percent reduction in energy usage, which gives you twenty nine points. And Brett, do we have a question? Well, just you know, getting to really the specifics where hemp fits into the HERS rating. Have you worked with a HERS rater before to sort of model it out? Again, you know, of course, you get your lead points by having a lower HERS rating. So, like, where does like this typically fit in may and maybe in relative comparison to fiberglass or something else as far as as you know hers points go yeah that's perfect and that's uh coming up in a slide or two um based on uh, the grade of installation um that being said um you know certainly understanding holistically how um things like passive house work uh, if you're able to design uh, and certify to the passive house standard, you automatically qualify for 20 points. So um, I think, you know, it's unfortunate that in the building industry and with a lot of sort of greenwashing of uh, marketing that's out there in the building industry, there's sometimes this perception that, you know, one product can be a silver bullet that's going to solve all your environmental needs and, and, you know, be greener or what have you. When the truth of the matter is you really have to think holistically about the, about the building envelope. So it's a combination, you know, uh, again, going back to the passive house standard of minimizing those thermal bridges, you know, picking, um, you know, building materials that are not going to be conductive or, or, you know, have those thermal bridges and energy loss. And at the same time, um, risk of condensation, uh, because of that delta T um, at those locations. And in addition, you know, integrating uh, an air control layer, whether that's, you know, uh, an interior um, vapor retarder, air barrier, or exterior uh, vapor permeable air barrier, um, really understanding how that assembly um, works together. So from my perspective, people that are interested in hemp insulation are the early adopters and tend to be the same types of designers or builders that are already aware of the building science considerations. So sort of that's one way that you can really maximize is, is doing passive house. Um, and then of course, you know, all the other credits we, we mentioned. Um, and then, you know, looking at her scores, uh, you know, again, 
you know, the, the best is going to be uh, her score of zero um, with the maximum of 29 points. Uh, again, pa passive house gets you to 20. All right. So you're almost there. Um, and this is uh, just a table talking about um, the refer lead reference home uh, and the floor areas and, and bedrooms um, and uh, et cetera, and how to kind of calculate that. I'm not going to get too deep into this. And then here's uh, to answer your question, Brett, to get to um, the grades of insulation uh, installation. So um, as compared to say fiberglass or other types of mirror materials, you know, cellulose, mineral wool, um, the key really is uh, a continuous um, monolithic uh, insulation with no gaps, right? You don't want it compressed. You want it filling the cavity completely. Uh, and, and that's what, you know, the HERS raters and inspectors are going to be looking for, for that grade one um, insulation installation. Um, grade two, um, you know, you do have those gaps, holes, um, and this is where, you know, your traditional types of faced fiberglass, um, you know, if it's just being done and stapled and, you know, or just stuffed into the cavity, you know, over time you do see slumping. Um, you can have gaps or it's torn through to, you know, put in an outlet or other types of penetrations and not really re-insulated um, tightly, um, you know, that, that can kind of penalize you. And then grade three, it's like, that's, that's a disaster. Just don't do that. Um, you know, similarly in things like dense pack cellulose or blown in, you know, unless you have someone really looking at that and testing it or someone with a, with a FLIR infrared camera to make sure there's no gaps or, or, or anything like that within those cavities, um, you know, you, you, you really wanna, you wanna have that grade one um, insulation installation. So um, this is from the Insulation Institute, which is from the North American Insulation Manufacturers Association. And this really talks about, um, you know, the, the reduction in her score from poorly installed insulation. And what I find most interesting about this um, is if you look at the cost of installing, right? So uh, a lot of times um, for projects that are really focused only on a single bottom line or, or low cost, right? Um, or, you know, sometimes, you know, unscrupulous contractors who just want to do a substitution request uh, for a cheaper product, right? Or value engineering. Um, you know, fiberglass bats, you know, the bat insulation is the cheapest, right? Um, however, there's only a small upcharge by having someone like a HERS rater uh, looking at the quality management and, and installation. Um, and I kind of look at this as similar to what the Air Barrier Association of America has done with, you know, requiring inspections and setting those guidelines for air barriers um, and things of that nature. Um, but I think what, what's really interesting here is, you know, in the market, there's a perception that, you know, getting a rig for, for blown, blown in cellulose or dense pack cellulose or spray foam, you know, there's this idea that it's cheaper um, and better um, when, when the truth of the matter is, you know, when you factor in mm -hmm. how much it costs to mobilize all the rigs, get there, spray it in, um, you know, it's, it's more expensive. And in addition, it, it limits your ability to actually do that quality control inspection. Question? Well, yeah, you know, and, and, and of course, the question will be, when are you all going to have a blown in uh, material? Uh, because people, I think, and, and the reason I think that question is important is kind of getting into what you're going to get into next. I'll let you get into that. But is, you know, how can this be superior to the install of fiberglass bats, which are pretty much designed to fail, right? And so we know the blown in has kind of been the answer to that in, in some regards, right? It just makes it easier. Plus it has a usually a better air sealing component. So maybe you're gonna get into this, but sort of just think through like, okay, are, are you gonna have a blown in? Is that on the docket? And then how do you install these? So they are grade one and the air sealing component, you know, what what do you all recommend for that? So you don't have to answer that now. I just wanna make sure if you weren't getting to those, you you kind of had those in, in, the, in the back of your mind, so. Yeah, absolutely. And again, thank you for teeing up. Uh, I'm going to try and speed up here because I know I'm getting short on time, but uh, that that's coming up. And and all I can say about, um, you know, the potential for a blown in or dense pack uh, uh, hemp insulation product is that hemp is a cellulostic fiber. 
Um, and as we know, um, you know, recycled newspaper and the paper industry in general is on the decline. So let me just say that. Um, and then, you know, again, you know, one comparison looking at the fiberglass bats, um, you know, versus something like a mineral wool, which from a, you know, a performance standpoint and a dimensional stability standpoint is going to be similar to, to uh, hemp uh, bat insulation. Um, you know, it's much easier to get that, you know, full uh, cavity filled um, with, with that insulation for that grade one um, rating. Okay, so installing hemp insulation. Here we go. Hey guys, I'm Matty Mead, founder and CEO of Hempitecture, and today we are on site in Los Angeles, California, working with our new product, Hempool. Hempool is a high-performing fiber bat insulation product. It's made from 92% industrial hemp. It can be cut and placed into your stub bays to insulate your thermal envelope, as well as insulate from sound. So over here, I'm going to show you the basic technique of installing Hempitecture hemp wool. We've already got this one pre-cut. What we're going to do is whatever size the stud bay measures, we're always adding a half inch. Hemp wool is a pressure fit insulation system. You lean it up, press it in, smooth out the sides. So I'm going to show you the basic technique. Always start at the bottom so you're not leaving any gaps. You really want to get one side to where you like it. And then you can take your other hand while holding and supporting the panel and kind of pop it in to the stud bay. Once that's popped in, you can see that it's protruding past the framing plane. You want to be able to smooth that out. And the best way to do that is just take your hands and rub them down the side of the panel. And just like that, we've got hemp wool installed. We're gonna put in this top piece to finish it. Just as we were adding a half inch for the stud width, we're also adding a half inch from the top of the panel to your block. So it's a pressure fit, snug system. Sometimes you have wiring and plumbing in the walls. With hemp wool, you have to notch around that. So on the back of this one, you can see we've already notched for this wire that would typically, if we just put this hemp wool over it, it would hold it out, make it bowed out, and that would ultimately affect the drywall or whatever finish you're going to put on. So we have this notch here, line it up, place that in, smooth it out, and you're on your way to having a healthy, comfortable, non-toxic, high-performing home. All right, so that would be a grade one uh, installation. Now, um, question uh, for Brett had about, um, you know, air control and, and things of that nature. I believe there was a, a question early in the chat about vapor permeability of uh, hemp wool, or sorry, hemp fiber insulation. Um, so it is vapor permeable. And it actually works great with um, some of the smart membranes uh, on the market, like you see on the right there. That's a photo courtesy of, of uh, 475 High Performance Building Supply, which some of you may know. And on the left there, you can see basically all the places it can be used. So the interior side of exterior walls, um, ceilings and floors, uh, partition walls, uh, basically everywhere you know, that traditional bat insulation is used. Um, horizontally, it, it friction fits or pressure fits in place. Um, so, you know, there's no, uh, no additional strapping or stapling or anything like that needed. And then um, this is kind of an, an interesting assembly. Uh, I believe it's a Passive House project. Again, this is courtesy of 475 um, High Performance Building Supply, but there you see the the uh, hemp bat insulation in the stud cavity and then continuous exterior wood fiber insulation. And on the interior side of that is a you know, vapor permeable smart membrane to act as your um, air control layer and get that air tightness. So in, in general, um, you know, depending on your climate, uh, there's different strategies, but in general, you want your wall to have good drying potential, um, if not at least in one direction, but uh, ideally in both directions, okay? Especially in mixed climates like we have here in the Northeast um, and a lot of the United States. As far as cutting, um, it is a very, very, very strong fiber. Um, so you can use power tools uh, using things like, you know, a, a fiber cement type of blade, circular saws, um, or what we call a wave 
form blade. So a serrated blade or blade or like a you know bread knife is probably going to get hung up on these fibers and pull it apart. Um, but the waveform blade actually will you know cut through it. And thank you. Any questions? <laughs> well, um, I wanted to go back to that last one you had there. You know, I know some, I know of like, uh, in fact, there actually is a rigid cellulose out there, believe it or not. It's kind of rare, but I know a company around here, they've done like a sort of a cut to fit, chip to fit kind of, even on a small project, right? But just, um, I'd assume that's going to be a lot, but on like larger volume projects, if they say we need X, Y, Z, is that something, you know, that can be done or is it all really required on the builder to be doing those cuts or is, you know what I mean? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So like a third party fabricator or cutter of the insulation. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, right now um, being mainly focused and, and being used mm -hmm. in, in things like, you know, accessory dwelling units, mm -hmm. ADUs, tiny homes, RVs, single family homes. Um, right now it's, you know, there, there hasn't been any, you know, massive projects that would require that. Um, as we start to enter, enter the commercial space, um, you know, there are, um, national distribution chains that have that capability that we would consider partnering with if there was that need. Great. Um, well, yeah, there are so many questions here. It is unbelievable. And I appreciate Max hanging out there in the background, trying to knock through as many as he can, but we're going to uh, elevate several of these questions. We want to hear from you, but before we get into those questions real quick, uh, yes, the answer is mostly always yes. You can head over to our YouTube channel, hit subscribe right now. Once this session is available, you'll be able to see it. It'll get posted and you'll get an instant update and you can rewatch it, share it with your friends, post it all over social media. We want to help you help us spread the word. Um, for those of you watching this in the future, not right now on the recording on demand, go ahead to get your continuing edge. You need to head over to our Thinkific channel or USGBC channel. Take the quiz with an 80% passing rate and you will receive your certificate. For those of you who are here live right now, as long as you've been here for uh, this whole time, you are now approved for your continuing education units. Uh, make sure you check certs at gutenbergcerts.com, mark it as safe, check your spam over the next couple of days, you'll get it there. Um, but we have lots of questions, we have lots of time for questions, so please don't leave, hang out, let's keep talking, but again, if you gotta go, I totally get it. And again, um, before we get into those questions, a huge thanks to our um, board of directors, our uh, volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reyna, uh, nearly 300 members, and uh, our top tier sponsors, uh, such as Mitsubishi and April Air. Uh, they all have products that are going to help you build greener, more sustainable housing, um, which we know you all want to do. So, um, Sean, let's just, let's just get it, this out of the way, right? <laughs> you know, how much is this going to cost me, right? Is 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 everyone's asking that question, and now with hyperinflation and new construction being unaffordable anymore, they're going to ask that question twice as hard, right? I mean, it's going to be the question, and so let's talk about it. And I understand you're not just going to say this is going to cost this much. I get that, but relatively speaking, right? We all have to, for the most part, legally insulate our buildings, depending on what state we live in. Maybe some of them not. You can just build whatever, but. <laughs> uh, we know all of us here, we want to build better. We want to get near passive house. That's the goal. We want every home a passive house. So you're making these choices and you've kind of laid out many of the benefits, but at the end of the day, uh, embodied carbon doesn't pay the bills, you know? And so what, what are we looking at here as far as some of the costs looking at fiberglass bats, uh, cellulose, uh, spray foam, right? huge R value there, uh, you know, mineral roll, rigid insulation, uh, foam, you know, what do you think this is uh, going to be like? Just where is it going to kind of fall? Sure. Yeah, we get obviously we get that question a lot. You know, that's probably uh, the, the, you know, the, the second most asked question uh, outside of can you smoke it? And the answer is no, don't smoke it. It's not going to get you high. Um, so uh, <laughs> so on the on the pricing question um, with the imported version, um, we've been slightly higher than your like high retail cost, slightly higher than your high performance mineral wool bats. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, as we all know, in the sort of, you know, pandemic world and the breakdown of global supply chains and chemical feedstock, um, a lot of insulation has been, you know, back ordered 
or unavailable for, for long periods of time. Um, so the first thing I'm, I'm going to say is that the nice thing about uh, you know, hemp wool insulation is that, you know, we can have it to your job site within a week or two. Um, and that's, you know, put it, put a, put a dollar on mount on that. I know that's an externality from an econ economic perspective, but time is money. If we're just talking, you know, straight costs, retail prices, you know, currently, or it has been a little bit higher than, than uh, high performance mineral wool in quantity um, orders for larger scale projects or people who are doing repeat business. We're actually pretty comparable uh, to mm. uh, the high performance mineral wool products. Um, that being said, most insulation manufacturers over the couple of years were seeing, um, you know, price increases every few months sometimes, um, mm. and also lack of availability. Um, we expect as we scale up our U.S. Uh, manufacturing to actually go the opposite way. You know, we should be seeing the price come down. We're still working on our margins to figure out what that price point is going to be and mm -hmm. also doing some testing to see what the market will set, accept. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the class A fire rated product will be, um, you know, a little bit higher. Perfect segue into the next question. Uh, a lot of questions here about the fire resistance, uh, you know, ranging from, you know, what is a bio-based one to, are you talking about borate? So can you give us a little more on that one? So all I can say is it's not borates, it's bio-based, it's zero VOC. Um, we, I don't know how much I can say right now because of intellectual property, right. um, but as the testing moves forward and we understand this and the intellectual property is um, secured, uh, I'm happy to share that. And all I can say is it's really cool. We actually have two different ones we're testing. I'm rooting for one um, that is really super cool if we can make it work and be cost-effective. Yeah, well, and can I make, I mean, a suggestion, a challenge to you all is, would you consider getting uh, on the red list or the, you know, the International Living Future Institutes? I know that requires a lot of transparency. Yep. Is it something you've all considered, you know, once you get through everything to be listed and open up, you know, your, your books to all your materials? Absolutely. That's something we have on my list of things to do after our sort of ASTM testing and thermal testing and, you know, like all, all of that stuff, fire testing, but yes, um, right up there is getting our LCA completed uh, so we can generate those EPDs and then have to declare labels. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you it's, it's zero red list. Thank you, declare. That was, it was, it was there on the tip of my yeah. tongue. So, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, let's talk about water, right? I mean, um, I mean, I would imagine someone using this is intending to be uh, more of a vapor permeable type of system. So a couple of questions, again, going back to that air leakage thing, I'd assume someone's not laying an inch of foam for the air seal behind this as a great strategy, uh, you know, in, the, in that regards. Um, certainly, you know, the unnatural versus natural tension there. But, uh, but uh, you know, just from an air sealing standpoint and keeping that vapor permeability, I think you spoke a little bit to it. And then also just from um, uh, humidity exposure, uh, uh, damp exposure, you know, exposure during the build site uh, where it could get, you know, whatever water and, and how that compares to cellulose. Uh, obviously our friends that, you know, sun radon are gonna help you out in regards to uh, making sure you have a dry area there. <laughs> uh, so during, you know, during the operations, but uh, anyway, um, can you just talk a little bit more about, um, you know, water exposure, both through uh, construction practices and ongoing? Sure. So, so let me talk about, you know, handling and storing um, first. So it is a natural fiber, right? So you don't want to leave that out exposed in the rain. Um, and also like sometimes even under a tarp, if there's, you know, condensation happening, um, you know, just through you know, water and air and, you know, organic material, if that gets in it, of course, like any other fibrous insulation, there's that risk of mold growth. Um, and also because it is a, a, you know, natural product, you know, if you're going to leave your wood or cellulose out in the rain, obviously that's problematic. So it does require, you, you are required to store that in a dry um, place, okay, and, and keep it from, from getting wet. Um, over long periods of time. You know, if it gets a little wet and you can dry it out, that may not be an issue. 
but certainly you want to store it in a, in a dry place um, out of the rain, um, ideally indoor or at least sheltered, right? Um, when it comes to uh, moisture performance, um, going back to what I was saying about, uh, you know, really understanding holistically the building envelope and wall assemblies or, you know, even attics, right? And if you're doing cathedral ceilings or anything like that, you know, understanding um, sort of the air, moisture, and thermal considerations there are really critical for product performance. And that's not just true of, of Hempel, that's true of every fibrous insulation. You want to make sure that that building enclosure has, has drying potential to one side or the other. <coughs> Excuse me. Now to touch on something like foam insulation, um, I do have to, you know, commend, uh, you know, the rigid foam, um, you know, industry for really improving on their embodied carbon. Um, so newer versions, if you can get them, you know, of extruded polystyrene, polyiso, um, you know, th those types of materials, if you're using for continuous exterior insulation, they, at least, you know, studies I've seen, they've actually reduced their embodied carbon lower than things like mineral wool, which require a lot of, you know, upfront uh, energy. So if you're looking at, you know, mineral wool versus, you know, foam. So, you know, I know everyone loves to knock, um, you know, uh, the plastics industry, but uh, there are some strides there. Um, so I, I think that should be noted. Um, so again, though, it's, it's not just what, if you're doing exterior continuous insulation, you know, it's not just what material you use, but it's how does that material work in your wall assembly specific to your climate and understanding the hygrothermal um, movement, uh, you know, of that um, building enclosure, which again goes back to air, um, air leakage, you know, thermal performance, uh, thermal bridging, um, and moisture management. Hemp fiber by its nature um, is, uh, well, a couple things. It, it can absorb moisture and then dry out. It can absorb, I think it's about 20% of its weight in moisture and not lose our value. So that's fairly similar to something like a mineral wool. Um, in addition, um, and this is more on the thermal sides, but hemp fiber also has some natural um, phase change abilities and, and sort of improved um, uh, phase change um, slowing of the, the, the temperature changes uh, through the building enclosure. Um, so again, though, like, you know, understanding uh, that it's a fibrous material, uh, it's vapor open, and how all those different components go together is, is essential for any fibrous insulation um, for long-term performance. And I'm always happy to, to share that and troubleshoot uh, those types of designs because, you know, the, the worst thing that could happen is if, you know, there's a failure, um, even if, you know, there's no air barrier or there's a big leak, right? And if there's then something happens and there, you get mold on the wood, or you know, sheathing, and then it's on the insulation. People aren't going to blame the other components; they're going to blame the hemp insulation because that's the new product, right? And that's that's true of any you know new product. Um, so you know, we want to make sure that people are doing this right and understand you know um, its capabilities in the in the holistic uh, design of the building envelope. Yeah, you make a good point. I mean, are you all planning to do any kind of? Uh commissioning in the beginning just to make sure things are installed correctly before you're the ones who get the finger pointed at you <laughs> when when there is a failure is that something you're looking at doing i know a lot of manufacturers have that set up or some kind of training like a hemp installation training class or certification or anything like that um i mean it's something we could certainly look at um yeah. in general you know outside of you know some minor changes and how it's cut it's going to behave exactly like uh, some of the other insulations out there, and the same building science principles, ex you know, exist. We're not, you know, we're not reinventing anything. This is all mm -hmm. well known um, how to do this uh, within the the construction and design and you know architecture um, community. So, um, you know, that being said, we do, you know, in our literature, you know, say that it will perform best with uh, the inclusion of some sort of vapor control. Um, or, you know, air barrier membrane. Um, so going back to the uh, volatile organic compounds, which we all know many insulations put these off. Um, so obviously we want to ensure all homes have balanced ventilation with recovery, you know, and that's going to help. We want that anyway, no matter what, but you do want to eliminate those VOCs at the source. 
So it looks like you all are doing that. I'm kind of looking at your list of things. I see this sort of VOC free logo, but what about, uh, you know, I think it's really sort of the green guard gold is really the standard. And even that's not perfect, but the standard for this, is that something you all are looking into and pursuing to sort of verify that? Yeah, absolutely. That That's on the list, um, maybe a little further out. Um, you know, that being said, we know it's zero VOC. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. if we need to get those labels, we certainly can do that. You know, similarly, we are, you know, mm -hmm. a certified, uh, um, you know, incorporated as a benefit corporation, but things like certified B Corp, you know, mm -hmm. may, may be another thing or, you know, just labels or, you know, all of these things, you know, we are very much a startup and in our infancy. So, you know, all of those things would be fantastic. Um, however, if I can ask all the attendees in order to get to that point, we first got to get through the basics of testing and our ICC evaluation reports and all of that stuff. And we need to start selling so we can then put that money back into those other certifications. So, so buy some hemp wool, please. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. And that's, you know, why, and that's, that's my another, shameless plug. <laughs> and that's another lead point, you know, having those, those certifications just to make sure they're, they're in place and, yep. um, and all that, uh, just to put that out there. But, uh, uh, yeah, there's, uh, so many, so many questions here. Um, you know, some of them kind of going off in a, in a little bit of a, another direction questions about, um, you know, hempcrete, uh, I mean, uh, again, your insulation, good in super cold climates, right? Six, seven, eight, just to be clear, it's, it's going to yeah. perform well, right? Yeah, actually the, um, the, the picture you showed on the, on your title slide of the guy with the orange hat laying yeah. on the, the hemp wool, he's actually a pro surfer based in Nova Scotia. You can check that out on the hemp texture, uh, YouTube channel. That's actually my favorite video. Um, mm. But for our purposes, I wanted to show a U.S. based project <laughs> with the mm. with the with the Silver uh, Lake L.A. Uh, project. But yeah, check out the Hepatexture uh, YouTube channel, and you can see uh, you know this pro surfer, you know, surfing in front of his home and and um, you know installing in in cold weather. Um. Question was, will the panels support siding fastened to the girts through the wall stud? Very specific. Uh, so this is not for exterior insulation as of yet. Um, okay. Yeah. So if, if you're looking for, you know, to do something like a double stud wall or an outrigger type of system, certainly you could use that. But this is, this is not for exterior uh, insulation as of yet. We are developing a semi-rigid board product that could potentially um, be used uh, in those types of uh, um, what you call like, you know, screw through insulation attachments, um, you know, similar to some of those semi-rigid mineral wools out there, uh, but not yet. Mm -hmm. um, what was the other question that we had here? Uh, there was a question about the weight and just sort of relative comparison of the weight of the product, you know, in general to a, a mineral wool. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we're actually um, right now we're we're optimizing our U.S. manufacturing. So I think it's around a two pound density. Um, and what we're finding is we can actually improve upon that three point seven per inch R value that we've been getting in the the, mm -hmm. um, the imported version. Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually working with Oak Ridge right now on density testing to optimize that. And then also, you know, that will inform the pricing. Um, but, you know, it, it's anywhere from one and a half to two pounds um, density. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a question here. And, and so maybe you can, if you want to do this, they wanted you to reshare the R value comparison chart. Um, so if you want to pull that up. Uh, the R value or the, the, the embodied carbon? You know, they said it are value comparisons. So I don't know if, uh, well, I'll tell you what, everybody, the slides, you should all have the slides so you can go back and reference it. And I'll just, for everybody's, uh, if you don't have it, I'm going to go ahead and just re-upload it again for you all. So that is um, coming on your way and then you have access to all those charts. So <laughs> if you have a specific question, go ahead and answer it. We've got a little more time or ask that question. Uh, on what you were looking for. Let's get into the farming conversation here and kind of going back to the start of it, you know, very interesting, you know, clearly the idea of being able to grow everything. 
locally or regionally and then source it that way and keep money in our local and regional economies makes a lot of sense. So what somebody, you know, in this regards was asking is uh, the, you know, when you're calculating your embodied carbon, is it factoring in the energy being used to actually farm it? You know, you've got these tractors, they're using diesel. And are you working with your farmers? And this is, I'm going to add to this one. Are you working with your farmers to electrify their equipment and use renewables? You know, I mean, how far are you going to go? I think of like, you know, coffee, right? You got a coffee, someone doing coffee, and sometimes they just, they're just right there, right? They're working with their farmers and they've got these stories. And so is that something you all plan to do to have those sort of collaborations and try to green up that side of it? Yeah, well, so, um, you know, again, just a caveat to this discussion, mm -hmm. because we were importing it, mm -hmm. that was based on those markets uh -huh. and um, how, whatever their relationships were in that supply chain. You know, now that we have our factory in Idaho, we've actually partnered with IND Hemp mm -hmm. out of Montana, which is one of the leaders in the industrial hemp, commercial hemp. Um, growing. They also handle the processing. Um, so yes, we are uh, very aware of that and absolutely land use um, carbon emissions uh, will be calculated in our LCA. Um, so yes, and, and of course, yes, as much as technolo technology will allow, mm -hmm. um, we'll be trying to encourage our suppliers to reduce that carbon footprint. Um, you know, I would love to see you know, it would be nice if we had the money one day to have our own fleet of vehicles that were all electric and supplied by renewable energy, right? But we're in the very early stages of that. You know, I know here in New Jersey, um, there's an initiative to switch all the trucking to electric. You know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. We'll see if the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, helps with that transition. Um, and then certainly, yeah, I mean, farm uh, machinery, uh, you know, usually diesel fueled uh, can have some significant emissions. Um, so it's going to be looking at that balance of how much does the hemp sequester, right? Um, so, I mean, the, 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 the honest mm -hmm. answer and the transparent answer is we don't know yet, uh, but yes, of course, we're going to be working to improve on every step of the supply chain. Um, and then the actual product itself, obviously we, un we know that for, for advanced sustainability, we need to move all um, annuals to, to perennials, right? I mean, that's being worked on with wheat uh, to some excitement. Um, and I, I forget, is hemp annual perennial? And is there a, you know, is there intention to move it to perennial? And then the specific question is, what climate zone can it be perennial? So. <laughs> Yeah, so no, it's it's not uh, perennial, it's an annual. However, yeah. if you use organic farming practices and crop rotation, it actually will rejuvenate the soil. So if, you know, if you have, you know, one plot um, that you've been growing corn in, say, for example, you know, or soy, right, or, you know, any other sort of industrial, you know, heavy um, pesticide and fertilized, um, you know, uh, industrial crops um, that, you know, um, really kind of um, ruin the soil. Um, hemp can be put into those plots for a year or two that pulls all the toxins, heavy metals, things out of it. You know, it chokes out the weeds so you don't need to use pesticides when it's growing. Um, and then after a few seasons, you can then, you know, rotate the crops again. Great. Um... So have you, so let's kind of fast forward, you know, I, I think we're, you know, what it seems to be is heading towards a world where, you know, we'll have more prefabrication and modulation modular for our, for our wall systems. I mean, it just seems no doubt that that's where we've got to head for a multitude of reasons. You've all been on many of our sessions talking about this and we have more coming up. So what kind of partnerships and collaborations do you have? Like, where like there's a specific question here about when do we get hemp sips, right? You know, it's just poof, it's right there. But then just getting this stuff into the modular process so that when those walls come pre-insulated and built, it's just right in there. Is there any conversations, any barriers to doing that or, or any opportunities you would share? Um, so the, the answer is we're already doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in addition, we have... Um, some partnerships where we're looking at improving on that technology for uh, future product development, um, possibly using, you know, uh, 
sort of bio-based thermal plastics um, and, and other types of things. Um, so, you know, the short answer is it's already being done, um, you know, and, and I'm happy to, to talk about some of the projects that might be a, another time. A lot of that has been in the tiny home or ADU market uh, currently. However, there are some very large uh, modular home builders uh, that we are doing prototypes and supplying already. Well, yeah, and and you know, we'll we'll hold you to it. We'll have you back on for uh, modular and hemp uh, roundtable or something, right? We'll we'll get you back on that. But uh, there are a lot of questions about um, you know pilot projects um, and you know being able to see those kinds of things, case studies, especially homes that have achieved you know HERS index ratings, passive house, and being able to kind of take a look and a peek at some of those ratings and what was evaluated on those. So do you all have any case studies and data you can share? Or also, I assume we have a large group of people here ready and willing to go. So, you know, they would love to build their next home with this. And, you know, is there an opportunity for that? Oh, a absolutely. So um, it it's funny that you bring that up because that's one of the things I've been trying. Uh, and actually, Max, who's, who's on here too, and um, our growth innovation specialist uh, internally, we've been trying to compile testimonials and reaching out to people um, who have used Temple um, in the past to kind of start to get those project profiles or case studies. Um, in addition, um, we do have some, some projects in the pipeline um, that we're looking at doing full case studies on. So if there are any, you know, architects, designers, uh, you know, home builders, um, you know, people in the industry that have a specific project they're thinking of, uh, please let me know because we are looking for that content um, as well as, you know, offering sort of additional um, discounts as sort of uh, marketing compensation. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, well we're looking for partners. Any, anybody who wants to help out, you know, we're happy to work with anyone and everyone. <laughs> and, and and we'd love to see one of you all get this done, get your home Green Star and Passive House certified and be back on the show to give us a virtual tour, right? That's what we want to, that's the challenge. So let's do it. Um, so, you know, on that note, Sean, we are um, over our time here. There are a lot of amazing kind of thoughts and questions out there. So I kind of want to let some of these more detailed ones have people reach out to you directly and get those answered and keep that conversation going. So on that note, where can people go to contact you or your team and, you know, learn more? Sure. Um, well, first of all, my email is sean at hempitecture.com um, right there on the slide. Um, you can uh, check out our website, although please uh, bear with us. We're in the process of transitioning with the new factory and all of our focus and energy is, is going into getting the, the factory open on February 17th. So we are aware that we need some, some updates on our website. Um, in addition, uh, we do have um, a buy direct platform, um, which is buy.hempitecture.com. So if anybody is, is looking to, you know, purchase hemp wool immediately, you can check that out. Um, you can also um, purchase samples. Um, if you are uh, an architect, designer, um, home builder, um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, or you can always reach out if, you know, Hemp Creek came out, uh, came up into questions. And I know there's a lot of interest in that, in that product. Um, Max, who's on the call, um, can be reached at uh, sales at hempitecture.com. Um, and, you know, we are starting to, we're still supplying and supporting those Hemp Creek projects. Mm -hmm. But at this point, we're now shifting our focus to, to the hemp wool insulation. Um, so yeah, Sean at hempitecture.com hempitecture.com, buy.hempitecture.com, uh, or sales at hempitecture.com. Well, great. Thank you so much, Sean, for joining us and for your time. Um, and uh, we really appreciate you coming out to talk to our group. And we hope to have you and some other folks back on here to keep getting the word out. Um, and for the rest of you, please join us next week. We've got the one and the only Joe uh, Lestibrick from um, Building Science Corp hanging out with us. So we know it's going to be a great time. So come on out. Uh, be well. Be safe. Take care, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Goodbye. Thanks, Brett. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. 
to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.